75, 76. All right. Good morning, everyone across the country and some that have dialed in from London and around the world. Welcome to the Women Business Collaborative monthly CEO roundtable. WBC is truly accelerating the numbers and changing the paradigm for executive leadership. We know that CEOs are critical in their caring companies and re-engineering in time of COVID. We are truly so focused on your leadership as we hear your ideas about change. We want to focus on the unbelievable call we had on April 22nd and the calls coming up for CEOs on June 18th, July 14th with C200 and Catalyst. We thank at least 100 people that are contributing to all of the richness. We have 300 people engaged with us in leadership. I want to acknowledge particularly Susan Scarrett, who recruited two of the CEOs today. And with that, with a sense of gratitude about CEO leadership, we turn it over to our co-host of the CEO Roundtable, amazing Robert Reese and Becky Schombau. Robert? Becky? Hi. Hi, I'm Robert Reese and there's Becky. Say hi, Becky. Hey, Robert. Hi, everyone. And welcome, everyone. So the vision of WBC is equal position, pay, and power for all business women. And this takes all of us, takes women, takes men working together. And we realized during this pandemic that people want more than anything. After they keep their people safe, how do I lead through these challenging times? How do I plan post-pandemic so our organization is stronger? And so we have put together an incredible group of CEOs you're about to hear from. And boy, I see the numbers keep rising of participants. That's great. So, so Becky is, is as uh, my partner in crime and is one of the leading experts on gender equality and inclusion. She's president of Shamba Leadership and she was actually one of the first executive leadership development programs she put together as founder of Women in Leadership. So we're going to have some fun today. Also, again, thank you to Susan Scarrett, who did a great job, brought in two fantastic CEOs who you'll hear from soon. And I'm going to tell you what the schedule that we put together is. So the speakers, they're each going to speak for about nine minutes, and we're going to kick off with technology. And that's Tony, who's over there from Microsoft. And Tony runs, actually, she's responsible for regulated industries. So that's government, financial services, healthcare, 14.5 billion PL. So Tony, if she was on her own, she would be like a Fortune 220 company ahead of Black and Decker, ahead of BlackRock, ahead of lots of companies and has brilliant insights. Then we're going to go into financial services and we're going to hear from Kelly Coffey, CEO of City National Bank. And as all of you know, this is changing the economy. Everyone is trying to get PPP, and she's gonna tell the inside story of how a bank, not just any bank, this is called the Bank for the Stars in LA, but it is national. Then we're going to hear from Steve, and Steve Tanger is the CEO of Tanger Factory Outlets, and what's brilliant and you wanna hear is he is a real thinker and you're going to hear what the future of retail is as all of the malls that they manage, and there's about 39, focus on retail. So you're gonna get an inside story for that. Next, you're going to hear from Zeta Smith, and you're going to hear about seniors. And she is um, the CEO of Sodexo USA Seniors. I think I got that right. But anyway, Sodexo is one of the greatest companies in the world in terms of diversity and inclusion. And she's going to share some insights on that. 
And then for our finale, we're going to go into architecture and we're going to have um, Richard Kennedy, who's the CEO of Skanska, which is one of the largest architecture firms. And he is going to share some insights that occurred on March 9th. Wait to hear the story of what they went through and what it's like real time leading through a pandemic like this. So Becky, ready to kick off? All yours. Thank you, Robert. And wow, with the lineup here, it sounds like we could make our own movie this morning. Um, this incredible lineup of CEOs and, and a lot of great thought thought leaders within this nation and the globe in terms of, in general, they're, what they're doing, what they have done in the past and, and bringing some of their ideas, uh, true stories together to really help us to not just talk theoretically, but what are some really um, thoughtful solutions and things that these organizations and their leaders are doing because at the end of the day when you're in a virus sort of pandemic era or in the good times leadership matters and this is really what this next hour is about is really showcasing some of that great leadership so I, I wanted to introduce our first pan uh, panelist Tony Towns I've known Tony Tony we're not going to count the years after a decade but it's been over a decade so um, we've traveled the, the, the roadmap together and, and doing a lot of great collaboration in the community leadership community together so it's an honor to have you here. Um, thank you for taking your time. Um, as Robert said, you probably are the size of the 14 and a half billion. My gosh, it's, it's incredible. But I just, just, just to kind of pause for a second with the reach that you have at Microsoft and beyond, what, what are you noticing right now? If you could just give us a few key themes uh, of what you're seeing out there. Yeah, from a tech perspective and really just from Microsoft all up, Becky, first let me thank you for just being part of the forum and the other guests here. I'm ready to learn and listen more than I'm ready to share, quite frankly. But, you know, we've, we've seen probably three or four key themes. One, uh, at, the, at, the real, at the onset of the pandemic, we really saw the use and the leverage of artificial intelligence and technology. You know, we've been foreshadowing for about three to four years that every company, every public sector organization is a digital organization at some level, has to have be building some of that infrastructure and capacity. And boy, did it show itself at the heat of the pandemic when it first hit, because we really started to use artificial intelligence with bot capability, with CDC and Health and Human Services to be able to assist those first line responders so that they were quite frankly able to provide care versus triaging all of the requests that were coming in. So really across almost every health community, AI was being used to triage questions, uh, sort of pushing people to different locations, different content, different information. That was critical so that we could actually get to the business and healthcare providers could be in the business of providing healthcare versus providing information. We also saw two huge themes around remote learning and remote work. And quite frankly, they even uh, overlap for many of us who are home, working from home and working with our children in education and helping them in the remote education. So we, we found in education that a, a lot of our higher ed institutions were pretty scaffolded for an online learning experience, doing fairly well, had made the right investments. K through 12 school districts, huge disparity across the country, lots of digital equity concerns around being able to have access and really in K-12, it really was sort of a, a variable experience and still is on remote learning. You know, we then kind of quickly figured out that remote work, we've been helping every state, every government, I'm doing a lot of work with New York State on the tech squad there with Governor Cuomo and others on remote work and what was required and, and, and activities and productivity like our team's uh, capability is up 60X around the world. Uh, and then finally, because I know we're going to talk about financial services, you know, it's one thing to talk about lending and infusing capital in the market. It's another about doing that during a pandemic. So we call it sort of cares to coop with every stimulus package. We have to have a continuity of operations in place for these financial institutions that are doing their best to lend to these small and medium sized businesses to keep them afloat. And so we're really learning what it is when you have a multitude of economic recovery actions, pandemic, and quite frankly, remote work and what that brings together in the society has created uh, really not only a challenge, but actually probably a set of opportunities as well. Right. And I'm sure with Microsoft going in and helping create these platforms, some companies were more crisis ready, right? And and, and some weren't. I know we've been talking about AI, that the pluses, but the threats to that, and of course the digital platform is all around change. 
So it seems like this is going to be a reality after we come through this, right? Uh, if indeed you haven't been set up for this. You know, you mentioned, we talked earlier about that, you know, in change, right, there's always the curve of change. And you mentioned that there's also a crisis curve around change as well, right? Um, can you explain to that? I mean, I guess there's, there's a dip right around the crisis curve. There's the, the heroic sort of, if you will, behavior. Everybody's helping one another, and then the reality sets in. I guess, what have you noticed out there, where organizations and people are, and what is your biggest concern, and, and Tony, maybe your biggest hope through all of this? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Becky. You know, I've been one of our greatest partnerships with Microsoft. We actually just announced a, a, a new uh, element of that partnership is with Johns Hopkins University with their precision medicine program over there with Dr. Paul Rothman, with some of the world's just best uh, thinkers and uh, technologists that have brought together medical and public health uh, capabilities with technology. And George Everly over at Johns Hopkins has done quite a bit of work on psychological curves for crises. And, and you talked about starting at heroic, it then moves to almost what they call a honeymoon period, hard, hard to believe, where you have a plan, everybody's out there working and actually the adrenaline is, is pumping and you feel the sort of the endorphins and it is a, a fairly high energy time. It's followed by a pretty steep drop into a disillusionment valley. And that's about when is, how long is it until the new normal? How long do we kind of sustain this? When will things get back to quasi normal? And I can see myself and the team are sort of coming into that place of really having to have that resilience, that resilience and keeping the energy going when we've gone past that adrenaline push in the first, and I'm, I'm sure the other uh, speaker seals have probably seen that. It is followed, I do wanna be hopeful here, it is followed by uh, reconstruction, uh, anniversary, when you start to remember moments uh, of your life and moments of your work life, and then it follows uh, into a full recovery mode. But there is a dip, and in that dip, we get really concerned about the mental health, the sustainability, the energy, and quite frankly, just the optimism. Uh, you know, it, there was a book written, if you remember, Becky, called Hope is Not a Strategy. In effect, hope is a strategy, and, and it is part of our uh, part of our cultural meme at Microsoft. We've been doing work in our culture before COVID, pre-COVID, on empathy, empathy in action. A lot of work with Brian Stevenson down at the Equal Justice Initiative, learning about what empathy looks like. And we've been applying that culturally to our interactions with ourselves, our, our employees, our teams, as well as with our customers, and generally with our community. And we're really trying to, to kind of bring that to the next level. So Microsoft's instituted about three or four different programs. One that uh, definitely self-care. I've got chief care officers, chief caring officers, CCOs across my organization that are just checking in on people. How are you doing? What can we do? How do we help? You know, we used to have all of our meetings with the video component. Realize that can be very difficult for people who have lots of challenges at home. So we even were starting to make sure that people could self-select how they wanted to engage in remote work. Uh, we, we've given a $10,000 per employee match to any giving or donation they want to make or donation of time or money. We're, we're matching everyone in our company. Uh, up to 10,000 to help this crisis. So different ways to engage, to keep the energy going, right. frankly, knowing that people feel like they're cared for. Yeah, it's, it's like doing that gap check because how I'm receiving this crisis could be different than you, Tony, right? Or vice versa. So it's doing those critical gap checks. I guess the last thing, you know, our time's gonna be up in a few seconds, Tony, but being one of the top women in the industry and also at Microsoft as an executive leader, how has the diversity, I know Microsoft has had a precursor in terms of diversity and inclusion, we've talked about that a lot, but how has this the diversity in women in leadership really helped through this, this crisis? I know we talked about the empathetic culture, but is there anything that you've noticed during these times? Well, you know, here's what I've noticed about myself, and, and I'm home here with my husband, and boy, we are creatures of routine. You know, we, uh, we didn't realize how routine we were until we had to go back and look at ourselves. And we've never had this much time together as a couple. That's another, uh, I think, podcast we could do to talk about, you know, re rediscovering marriage in that environment. But I'll tell you, it, this routine culture allows you an opportunity to learn a lot about yourself. I've learned a lot about my teams, how much routine matters how important it is and how not to, quite frankly, marginalize routine. At the same time, it gives you an opportunity to introduce new. And so I'm physically doing something different every day. 
-hmm. And it sounds odd doing a call from each room in the house, finding out different parts of my community, engaging with someone that I would have never spoken to previously, or maybe just wouldn't have come into contact with uh, via catch catching sort of double and triple skip levels in the org. It's, it's really, I'm even with Johnny, my, my husband, we're trying to engage different, eating at different times of the day. All of these ways. One minute left, Tony. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the time check. So it's about introducing change and uh, getting yourselves more and more comfortable with that change that I find many of my female executives and, and colleagues are really starting to challenge themselves or challenge each other in our circles about change really building that that change muscle and, and and actually I've been practicing that since I talked to you eating in the different rooms and parking at a different side of the driveway and and it, it, it seems like you know the empathetic culture is a common theme in our prior April web you know sit around table and, and today um, and, and in terms of it, it we always talk about it intellectually right we need to build that empathetic culture but it seems I could be wrong but I'm hopeful that we will put this as a as a strong sort of business imperative and also a human imperative to really build those more empathetic cultures Absolutely, right. absolutely, Becky. Tony, thank you so much. And Robert, I'm going to turn it over to you now to um, for our next guest, to Kelly. Kelly Coffey, how are you? I'm um, great. Good morning, Robert. How are you? In your right. car. I love it. Yeah, there you go. And we got to be flexible, right? I'm, I'm flexible. actually sitting in a coffee shop to get the Wi-Fi from there. So flexibility is us these days. That's true. And, and, and like Tony, always want to learn, do something new every day, right? That's thank right. you. So. So Kelly, let, let's talk about um, City National Bank, which is actually called the Bank the Stars, but banking is in a different situation than anyone because you have had, I heard something like 16,000 applications for PPP. Just talk in this pandemic about how you manage and how your company manages with this. Yeah, thanks Robert. So. Um, first of all, this is this is a very this is a health crisis. First, it's a very personal crisis, um, and so you know, my organization, our all of our thoughts um, and prayers go with everybody affected and all of the healthcare and first responders. But we are a bank, and so the best way we can help is to help our clients. And you're absolutely right. We're known as the Bank to the Stars because of our dominance in entertainment. And our hometown in LA, but we do a lot more than that. We interact with um, both middle market companies and high net worth individuals is the bulk of our business. So when business ground to a halt, it, it's an incredibly scary time for all of our clients who had to literally close their, not all, but most of our clients had to close their businesses, the entire entertainment business ground to a halt. We think about it, Broadway's closed and, um, and that was pretty extraordinary. I think the administration, both the Fed and the Congress moved really quickly and the CARES Act has been incredibly helpful. Um, and PPP was the part that we were in, in the middle of. So I think when Tony describes that initial adrenaline, our adrenaline went longer than maybe it would have otherwise because first it was mobilize and get everybody working from home. And even though as a bank, you have to have a plan for a pandemic, we had one. You know, we do that with our regulars all the time. A, a real pandemic, and a pandemic that's global, everything shutting down at the same time is different than maybe what you plan for. And technology was key. And thank you to Microsoft and many others for keeping us working. So we, we did that very quickly. Um, and then very quickly, the CARES Act came out. And so we, we are, uh, we're focused on helping our clients. And that was an all hands on deck exercise because um, while Congress and, and the SBA was moving very quickly, the rules were changing multiple times a day. And so to keep our clients understanding what was going on and to be able to, you know, it wasn't just to have a phone call and take an application. That was multiple phone calls and emails and through the weekends, et cetera. So it was a fabulous, you know, experience when we think back on it and it's not done, but of literally the whole company coming together. I mean, you, you had the bankers out front talking to the clients. You had a lot of support people coming in. We had people from HR helping to check applications, people from marketing who volunteered to help input things. So we, we're a top 25 bank. In the first round, we were in the top 10 of the country in terms of the amount of funds that we secured for our clients, which was something that everybody at City National is incredibly proud of. Really important. So you're putting everyone, HR, into filling out applications. Everyone's doing new jobs. You came from a different background, more of more formal with JP Morgan. 
and more structured. And here you are in a real, this deeply caring community bank. What did you do to, to engage and to galvanize all of your team? And as you've told me in the past, like you keep them having fun as well, which is not always as easy. Talk yeah. about specific things that you did there, Kelly. Well, first of all, first of all, I have to say the culture of City National has always been incredibly geared around the client. It's if you think about it, it's the it's that relationship hometown bank that kind of if you remember the tagline here's everybody knows your name, but yet with all the big we're top twenty five bank, all of the big bank capabilities, plus we're one hundred percent owned by RBC, so an incredible access to to a lot. So I think that combination is fabulous. So the culture was already geared toward jumping through hoops to get what the client wants done. That, that absolutely, um, I didn't have to do really anything to get that going. My, the, the team was fabulous and came together really, really quickly. I think what, this is a marathon though, not a sprint. And so I think the role I played was trying to keep people, um, even though they were working 24 seven and we literally had people handing off you know, overnight to make sure we could enter with all the, with, you know, we only had so many connections to the SBA. And so we did have kind of a shift thing going um, just to keep people taking breaks and actually, as you said, having some fun. So, you know, we did a lot of different things like, um, I, you know, I started a weekly people are, I think are craving communication. So one of the things we did is I started a weekly podcast where I'd update them on how we were doing on the program, what was going on at City National, how we're incredibly strong from a liquidity standpoint, helping our clients. I'd have a different person that I'd interview. Um, that would be launched every Friday morning at 6 a.m. our time and a 98% open rate and most of them opening at between 6 and 7 in the morning. And just that made people feel, uh, feel good. We um, we also donated, made our largest donation ever, $2 million to a number of different organizations around COVID, which people, uh, our colleagues um, felt was, uh, they felt very proud about. And, and we reserved a, a part of that to help colleagues who are having issues. Um, so, uh, and so that's, we're going to have it managed by an outside um, firm to help us, but a city national bank colleague fund was important. Um, for all of those still going into the branches, we did um, we, we're, we're paying them extra if they have to go in and sit in the branch um, when most people are working from home and interacting with the public. But we're also sending them um, sometimes lunch, sometimes cupcakes during the week, and they're from our clients' businesses. So we're helping our clients stay in business while um, helping our colleagues uh, have terrific. a little bit of fun. And, and we had a really fun pet competition. Everybody sent in um, pictures of their pets, and we put a whole thing together, and um, we've had some really fun moments and meetings where, you know, cats decide to jump in front of the camera while you're presenting or people are presenting. And it's, it's, it's been a really great way to get to know people in their home, kids running through. Uh, and that, that part of it's been kind of fun, but I'm, I'm focused on making sure keeping people together. The one other thing I'd mentioned, and it's not necessarily about fun, but up, about information that I'm sure other companies did, but we found really helpful is we put a microsite together with everything you need to know. Um, tag and always updated and that gets we're 5,000 um, uh, colleagues and we're pro and it, it gets somewhere between 3,000 5,000 hits every single day in terms of people looking for info so, so those are some of the things we did it's terrific you've done a lot of great things I love that pet competition let's talk about women let's talk about diversity so there are certain things I'm taking that come from the way women think in leadership during this crisis. Talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think women um, are mostly pragmatists, I think, if I were to summarize it one way. And I think optimists, and I think it's hard to generalize. So I say this, you know, as, as a woman, I've never been a man. So I don't, I don't know what it's like to lead as a man. I only know what it's like to lead as a woman. But when I look at women around my team, and I, and I feel it's really important, as you and I talked about, to have a diverse team, but that's not only from um, a, a sex or a, or, or a um, background. It's, it's really different a diversity of perspectives. You know, you have to have the optimist at the table, but you need the cynic at the table to understand the cynical point of view. And, you know, you need people who are really good listeners, strong. So I, I do think women in general, when I, when I do generalize, are very good listeners, um, have pretty high EQ, um, and, and have a very good gut feel for what a group or a team might need at a certain point of time. And I think that has been, the idea flow has been 
really great. One of the other things I did a year ago when I spoke or started as CEO was I launched something called Tell Kelly. I think getting feedback and ideas from every part of the organization is really important. That's something I, I learned um, across, along my career and learned at JP Morgan for sure. And so that's a place where anybody who works at the bank can just send me an idea, a thought, a criticism. A, and, and that's been, a, I read them every week. Um, and we, it's been a really good source of information on how people are feeling and also ideas for us, like, um, you know, things like, why don't we play music in our branches? Let's put, and we, that's a great idea. Let's put music in our Super. branches. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it flags for things, you know, like, Hey, can you take a look at our maternity? Pol I, we doubled the maternity policy in the last year. So things to just flag for me that um, I might not, you know, I've got a lot on my plate. I might not notice, but that's really important to a colleague somewhere. And if it's important to them and I can see, you know, who all, it, it just gives me a really good direct feel of the organization. In addition to all the, you know, we've done great happy hours. I drop into different meetings. I mean, that's one thing that, that Zoom helps you do or whatever, you know, whether it's Microsoft Teams, we use a bunch of different ones. It's just, it's easy for me to pop in places where physically I couldn't move quite as fast. And I'm finding that really fun. Although I do think to Tony's point, I am finding when you're sitting all day on one of these platforms on video, it is draining. I mean, we did a board meeting last week and I had two days because I happened to be two boards um, on the board of Snapchat as well. And I was just and I was destroyed by the second night. And it's not as long of a day as I'm used to working. So there's something there. The energy isn't flowing quite the same way. And I think you do have to be mindful of different types of interactions. Thanks, Kelly, it. Robert. I think we unfortunately need to move on, um, Robert, to the next uh, panelist. That was great, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks for having me. OK, yeah. I guess that's my cue. With Steve Tanger. So Steve, and thank you so much, Kelly. So Steve is, is the CEO of Tanger Factory Outlet Centers. So um, do I see Steve up there? So Steve, what they did is a real thinker. And again, this is thanks to Susan Skerritt for bringing such great CEOs like Kelly and Steve. So um, somehow the whole organization had no COVID-19 problems or deaths and planned everything super early. Now, it's a really interesting organization because it's 82% women. So maybe that had something to do with it. But Steve, talk about your planning prior and how you emerged in a, in a strong position, because I think the entire world was blindsided. Well, nobody could have known that COVID uh, was coming except for people that, that may speak Chinese. Uh, we certainly didn't see it coming. Uh, we did see disaster and other types of pandemics eventually coming, so we were prepared. We spent a lot of time organizing ourselves with off-site continuity, uh, and we are able to mitigate any impact of a pandemic the same way we were able to mitigate the impact of any hurricane, uh, natural event, which closes all of our properties. We spent a lot of time and a lot of money investing in technology as part of our culture and ongoing planning. Uh, we had the hardware, the software, uh, and the systems ready so that we could operate remotely. Uh, and our corporate office, like many of your corporate office, has essentially not been open for three months, yet we continue to function remotely and seamlessly. Uh, we were ready to meet by any of the platforms, uh, whether it's Zoom or the Microsoft platform Teams. Um, uh, so it's just like we're working in an office today and can interact and can share ideas. Uh, the minute the stay-at-home mandates in various states uh, were, were effective, we started planning as to how to reopen stores and get them back into business. We're a, we're a culture of, of uh, earning money, working hard, and capitalism. And this entire pandemic 
has put a pause in that in that global culture, and I I hope we can recover quickly. Uh, we have the most important planning that we did with the help of Susan Skerritt and other members of our board. For the past 35 years, we built a balance sheet that's a fortress. We maintain very low leverage so that in time of crisis, we had a very large $600 million line of credit that was unused. And we immediately drew that capital down and it's now in our account. The first thing on our planning for a crisis, number one in bold letters, do not run out of cash. Easier said than done. Let's talk about the diversity in your organization and I commend you on tremendous planning and foresight. You obviously run a really well-oiled machine. 82% women, what is your take on how women helped drive that success? Uh, gender diversity, ethnic diversity is part of our culture, and I'm sure part of everybody's culture that's on the, on the phone. It's easy to talk the talk when times are good, but now uh, you, you realize how important it is to have that diversity of thinking and backgrounds, different family setups. Everybody, is, everybody brings various life experiences to the table to help us through this. Uh, as, as somebody said to me one time, everybody is autobiographical, and the key to that is to sharing what you've learned. Fortunately, our now longest serving director is a lady by the name of Bridget Ryan Berman, who's been with us for 10 years. So we were one of the first, I believe, public companies to embrace that. And we now have 50% of our independent directors are, are female. Uh, and you mentioned 82% of our workforce is female. We're very proud of that. And it's, it's part of our culture. We don't even think about it. It's just part of our culture. Okay, you have about two minutes left <clears throat> about the future of retail. Everyone knows that retail has been decimated. And because you are, you are focusing on retail in, um, in outlets, you get a firsthand bird's eye view. What's your take on retail, how it will rebound, and what the future looks like? All of our properties are open air environments. You're not breathing recirculated air. I think the people will feel more, feel more comfortable shopping in an open air environment. Uh, by the way, I want to I say, because I'm on a hospital board and I just heard um, the CEO was telling us in COVID could last three hours internally, but when it's external, it's only 90 seconds. So that's a huge thing. We're going to put you in our TV commercials. Uh, <laughs> we, we like to say, <clears throat> in good times, people like a bargain. And in tough times like these, they need a bargain. Well our, type, our type of retail is outlets coming direct to you from the brand names directly, and you cut out the middle person. So inherently, you get a terrific savings on brand name products. That's the way we've survived for close to 40 years with the advent of all different types of retail, both online and physical. Our business prior to COVID was thriving. Uh, we had significant operating cash flow and uh, we had a 27 year uninterrupted history of raising our dividend. But the world has now changed. Retail will change. There will be significantly less retail choices going forward. There's a lot of bankruptcies caused by highly leveraged uh, uh, private equity funds falling in love with specialty retailers. All, the, all that will now change. The finest names like Neiman Marcus, uh, sadly, will have to be restructured. But there are people sitting probably on this phone who have children, grandchildren, friends that have a dream. They love fashion. They want to create. 
There's the new Tory Burch out there. There's the new Ralph Lauren out there. They will be uh, create new must-have type of items. Uh, nobody needs another, uh, except my wife, needs another handbag. You want another handbag. And nobody needs another pair of shoes. You want another pair of shoes. That's just the part of our culture that will survive. We, there will be a cure. There will be mass vaccination. And we will get through this crisis like we've gotten through the Spanish flu and the plague from 200 years ago. Seems like there's a major pandemic every 100 years. Fortunately, we won't live to see the next one, but we will get through this one. I will tell you our view is that the Spanish flu of 1918 was followed by the Roaring Twenties. And our dream, and we're working real hard with everybody we can talk to, to have the Roaring Twenties of this generation follow this COVID crisis. And I think it will. Thank you, Steve. Robert, thank you so much. So interesting. I had one of the participants chat. I'm ready to go out buy, to buy a new handbag right now. So there you go. <laughs> Well, Zita, lovely to have you here. And you. Um, it, we're just, you, you know, you've got a vast amount of experience. I call you the, the lady in crisis. It seems like working for Exxon early on and then Starbucks. And then you actually started to work for Sodexo Communities, right? In January of 2020. Now you think yes. about that. January 2020, officially the COVID, the pandemic crisis that was announced March 1st or in some ways before that. So, Wow. I guess not expected, but how did you initially handle that transition for yourself and then building your team out? Yeah, what a, what a way to begin uh, onboarding uh, experience. And, um, you know, basically the, the first two months was just learning the job and then you run into a, a crisis. And to your point, um, crisis management, unfortunately, was not new to me, but the, the company was. And I, I actually think it really... Um, created a platform that you have to act quickly, um, you have to mobilize quickly, and you have to communicate consistently. So I, I actually use it as an opportunity really to introduce myself and my leadership message um, throughout this process. So, you know, I lined up daily calls, um, daily Zoom calls. I can see that's everyone's favorite these days. Um, but it was important. One, you're on camera, so it created kind of this personable um, connection, but having them daily seems quite aggressive, but you can form teams quicker. Um, you know, we're moving at a very, very fast pace and things were changing um, very quickly. So you can keep everyone informed um, as well. And the other piece that was with my direct reports, which there are 14 of them, but the other piece was just remaining consistent in contact with the, the field team. So I have 3000 employees that are working within our senior communities across the country. And they need to know what's going on because people will fill in the blanks if they don't have the communication. So to me, it became kind of this daily routine and leadership message. And I think ultimately, you know, people got to know me as a leader. I was new, but nevertheless, you get to know me a lot quicker. And then you can build trust and credibility quicker as well. So I think through a, a, you know, standing up some of those um, protocols, you number one, get to hear and solve problems much quicker, but I do think you do increase the credibility very quickly as a leader because you're, you're willing to solve and, and listen to problems. Well, we thank you and your organization for your service. Uh, I may not paraphrase this correctly, but your business is really ensuring that the senior living communities are safe or fed, they have the right proper care. Is that right? I guess, I mean, I don't know if they've ever experienced this kind of an episodic event before. I, I would imagine the communication is at most, but in terms of your guiding principles around leadership matters, right? How are you, I've never seen something like this, particularly in the senior living, you know, sort of community. So, how are you sort of carving out your leadership there in, in, in terms of keeping things norm, somewhat normalized or calm and, and meeting the needs? Well, you know, I think leadership style wise, um, you know, I, I had heard this quote about leadership is like a tea bag, your true colors show up in hot water. And for me, people want to see a calm leader. Um, no one wants to see someone that's emotionally losing it when in fact you're going through a tough time. So I thought that was, really important but i you know 
we take care of the most vulnerable population through this pandemic. And if you just have to look at the news and see the, the, the negative publicity of, of really the, in, the negative impact it's had on many of our senior residents. So it's really important for us to help tell the story that there are, there, there are safe procedures and safe protocols where majority of my 3,000 employees, I think we had less than 10 that actually tested positive, you know, uh, COVID positive which is, is really saying it's really about following safety protocols um, and making sure that these senior residents, you know, stay safe. Part of the job of, of Sodexo and specifically with Sodexo seniors, you know, we are, we, we, they outsource to us to provide food, maintenance, and cleaning. So you could just imagine many of our employees get to know these residents. Um, they're, they're serving and preparing their food they're cleaning their rooms. So when, when COVID arrived, you know, obviously it really, really impacted the, the emotions of, of many of our, our staff. So to kind of keep the, the emotions up, we actually created a whole recognition program. Basically, these are heroes. We hear a lot about the healthcare heroes, but, you know, think of the senior centers. These are people that live there for the rest of their life and we are taking care of them, whether we're cleaning their rooms or fixing their food. So as they're working steadily each day and sometimes they receive sad news about a resident, how do we pick them up? So we created really a pretty rigorous uh, recognition program that we could celebrate each other and celebrate our heroes um, in our digital space. So we have a, a Sodexo Facebook, um, also certainly on LinkedIn, but we also have everyone send in pictures so that we can send out a deck once a week that people can see all the great things that are happening and how we're supporting our, our senior residents. We've had Easter bunnies, we've had, um, you know, Mother's Day cards, um, but there's a lot of creativity just to make sure that our residents aren't forgotten and that they feel that they're, they're taken care of, especially being isolated for so long now. Well, to have your team be present with that environment, right? I mean, I think it's so rewarding, eh, but so emotionally potentially draining. I mean, I know they've signed up for this type of work, but not necessarily this. And you, I think they were involved in the, the Boston bombing episode. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so as, as Tony mentioned around the crisis curve, I think for organizations is to be monitoring that crisis curve. And, and doing that gap check around people's mental well-being. And I think everybody could be in different states. So how does Sodexo or Zita, how are you doing that with your team specifically, if there's any practical advice there? Yeah, and I think sometimes it's simply checking in. Sometimes it's simply giving a call to some of the frontline employees. We had you know, uh, a, you know, a couple of communities that you know, were, were, were hit hard. Um, and just picking up the phone and talking to some of the general managers about how they're feeling. You know, we have a program with LifeWorks, um, basically an EAP, um, that actually have taken more of a proactive stance of, of setting up uh, time for a virtual call-ins um, to just kind of talk through, um, you know, how to handle um, these particular situations. There's no easy, there's no magic bullet for feeling, for feeling better, but people want to know that you care. And as things continue to evolve and change, people wanna know that you're listening. And so I, I've had multiple calls with our unit managers as well as our field leaders, just to serve as a platform for understanding where are we um, both emotionally and what problems we can help to solve. So I'm hearing the vigilant around the communicate. Don't assume, assess, right? And yeah. this is when the active listening and the empathetic listening is so, so important. One last question. We probably have about 30, 40 seconds left. I know Sodexo has been out there as one of the pride true, you know, companies around inclusion and diversity and not just having the statistics, but really walking that talk around diversity and inclusion. Um, a theme for WBC is to accelerate equity, to accelerate inclusive work cultures, right? So mm -hmm. how has this, you, you know, the population, the demographics and the culture around inclusion supported you in your efforts? How has that paid off? Well, I can say generally, being new to Sodexo, uh, how refreshing it is to walk into a room of senior level executives and have 40% be women, 
40% be people of color and almost 20% be women of color. So those are, we are the people that are making the decisions for the entire organization during the most important time of our lives in this industry. And to know that there's certainly a breadth of experience, a breadth of knowledge that comes from all of that diversity of thought, I, it really makes me feel very confident that we're arriving at a well-rounded decision to help solve these problems. Great. Sita, thank you so much for sharing thank your you. story personally and what Sodexo and your organization is doing. Thank you for all your great help. Um, our last speaker um, is Robert Kennedy. Robert, wonderful to have you here. Um, Robert is the CEO of, if I pronounce it right, Sanska. Is that right? Skanska? Yeah, it's Richard from Skanska. Richard sure. from Skanska. So Richard, Robert, <laughs> Richard, thank you. I apologize for that. Um, okay. So you all, you are in the building business, your organization, if you look on their website, they build bridges, they br build major hospitals, uh, infrastructure, um, office buildings, you have property management, you also build residential homes, and you're, you're global, you're in probably every, your footprint is everywhere around the globe, which is amazing. So tell us on March 1st, and whenever you realize that there was a crisis, you know, you're, I'll imagine a lot of your work is staff office but it's also people out in the field right and so exactly. what was what are some of the first things you did when you learned about the crisis for your organization so we we uh so yeah so hello everybody so richard kennedy from skanska as you mentioned uh becky we're we're about a 20 billion dollar year company we're based in sweden uh, about 40 percent of the business is here in the u.s we have operations across the united states uh, microsoft tony is a big client of ours out in the seattle region and um, we started to first see this in Seattle, uh, which where it first hit the U.S. Uh, we issued a safety notice to our company. Safety is a very important core value for us because we have people out in the field working. I mean, keeping people safe is key to what we do as a company. Um, so we, we had our first warning to the company on, I think it was February 27th. We sent out a general notice. And look, folks, we, we're watching this COVID uh, situation. We're getting, you know, we're following the CDC. The CDC at that point, and I remember looking at the notice, said the risk in the U.S. was low. And within seven or eight days of that, that kind of flipped. And uh, we saw this sort of pour across our operations. Um, Robert mentioned March 9th. That was, my, that was my first real heavy experience with COVID-19. We are renovating uh, LaGuardia Airport here in New York. I'm based in Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, that's a $4 billion plus project. And we received notice on uh, the morning of March 9th, it was a Monday, that the executive director of the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, um, had in, uh, was infected with COVID. And he had just, he had just walked our project uh, a few days before with my entire senior team. Uh, we're getting ready to turn over a big piece of that, uh, that facility in the next uh, month or so. And uh, if, you, if you know the CDC's websites and guidance, they say if people are potentially infected, they're within someone who is actually infected uh, for a certain amount of time that they need to be quarantined. Well, I was faced with this sort of situation where I might have had to have quarantined my entire, my entire executive leadership team on a large project. So I just found right away, we sort of, from that point forward, March 9th, we started to see uh, these potentially infected investigations popping up all across the country. It sort of was a slope like that. And uh, it was a very intense period and fortunately, relying on our values of safety and um, coming together as a company. I've been with the company for a long time, about 16 years. I've developed a lot of strong relationships over that period. And I, I thought it was amazing. And I'm sure many people on the call have had the same experience. The people that you know and the relationships you've built, how it all came together and just um, supported the effort. You trust each other. You know each other. You know your strengths and weaknesses. You know how to communicate with one another. You rely on that and you rely on your values as a company. In this case, you know, making sure we keep people safe, we do the right things. Um, they all came together in a really good way for us. Very, very intense period in the beginning of March for our company. You mentioned the values, Richard. I think a lot of companies are going back to the basics, the, the mission, the values, the operating principles. And when we, when we spoke a while ago, you talked about your values were probably the key factor for, you know, moving through this crisis and, and uh, managing it in an unexpected sort of, if you will, situation for the organization. So 
how, give us a story, if you will, of how your values have played out, because I think that's a, a foundation for a lot of these organizations in terms of how they're sustaining the organization and their employees. Yeah, I would say, so back to that, that story about LaGuardia on March 9th, very intense situation. We're building a $4 billion project. We're trying to deliver a major piece of infrastructure there. All of a sudden, we have to now face this issue of quarantining people. And it was chaotic. People, you know, what are we going to, you know, my team, how are we going to handle this? What are we going to do? At a certain point, I remember that day, I'm like, hey, we're going to do what we do as a company. Our core value as a company to keep people safe. Let's not worry about what's going to happen. We're just going to continue to focus on that and do whatever we have to do. And in one sense, let the chips fall where they may. And, you know, if, if that's when it matters most, especially for our people. What I started to see in that, in the first days of this, were this, this, um, the sense that there was a question about our commitment to safety, for example. People were saying, why, and I heard this through the company, well, wait a second, why are we continuing to operate if we really care about safety and people's health and well-being in the middle of a global pandemic? And the answer is, we have to continue our business. If we don't have a business, we're not in business and no one's employed, but we have this core value of safety. So it was, it's sort of just backing up for a second. And, and as Zita said, people want to see calm leadership. Say, hold on a second. This is what we do, folks. We're experts at safety. It's our core value. Let's just lean right into that. We're going to be safe. We have to step back. We have a new, you know, sort of hazardous condition on our sites. This is what we deal with as a company. So let's deal with it the right way here. Let's step back. Let's plan our work. Let's employ the right PPE. Let's find a way to socially distance. And let's go ahead with what we do, which is construct projects in a safe and healthy way for our people. And then we've talked about diversity on this call. And that's been a, a value that we've, um, we've been focused on, I'd say, for like about 12 or 15 years. When I first um, joined the company back in 2004, I think we were more traditional construction company. The industry of construction tends to be male dominated, particularly white male dominated. I don't think there's anything um, inherently corrupt in that. I think it's just the way it is. But we started to recognize back in the early 2000s that we had to change our industry, our company as part of it to get more out of uh, diversity. It's good for business, right? And then on the heels of um, diversity, we started to talk about concepts of inclusion, which was, I'll be honest, was quite sort of a, a novel concept for a construction company, which is just a traditional company. But I've watched us build on those, those concepts and those values have become part of who we are, who we aspire to be as a company. And I have been so impressed with the way that has paid off. You know, I've watched us build on those concepts and train people and talk about it, really, you know, inculcate it as part of our culture over the past decade and for real. And then all of a sudden, COVID-19 comes along, global pandemic, and, and I see it come out in such a fantastic way. I was participating in these coordination response team calls every day for weeks on end uh, to make sure that we were coordinating our response across our entire operation in the U.S. And on that call, it was balanced 50% women, 50% men. We wouldn't have seen that in 2004. And I think Kelly said, uh, women bring a level of pragmatism to the, uh, to the to the conversation and I saw that come out in a good way. I remember having early conversations in say 2005 when we were talking about inclusion as a leadership team and it was all white men. And I was a younger member of the group at that time. And I remember us saying, wow, we can't imagine what, what will it be like when women enter the leadership team, right? There was just a conversation we had. And now 10 years or 12 years later, I can't imagine not having women at the table. I mean, they bring such a perspective that I think we need and it's been so beneficial to the conversation. So it's just things like that. Our values around safety, around inclusion, around diversity, around being open and transparent with each other, around committing to our customers. We work for a lot of healthcare uh, clients in, in the US and you can imagine the pressure they've been under uh, through this period. And we've just focused on what is important to them, what's important to their business. And I've seen how that's carried us through. It's been an opportunity to build our relationships with them. So. It's, it's been very rewarding for me, very satisfying as a person who's been with the company for a long time and been part of building our culture around our values to see how they pay off in a time of crisis. It's, it's, like a warm, it's been like a warm blanket that I've been so happy to have. Right. You know, just one more thing here. Thank you for our, our, time, our time is actually up on this interview. So Richard, I want it, sorry, I'm so, 
Um, Richard, I want to thank you. And I'm going to give a quick sum up. Or Becky, did you have something like 15 seconds to say? Well, I think the theme here is we're better together, right? And I think it's the cognitive diversity. It's, it's really pressing and, and punctuating our values. It's the mindfulness and the intentionality around doing that gap check with our, not only our, our employees, but those that we're serving out there in the field, right? And I think this is what matters right now, as Tony said in that curve, right? It is to really bring in the values and the operating, operational mission and, and really live that. Um, because that's why we have these institutional, if you will, uh, key elements of our, our culture. So thanks to everyone. This was fantastic and it was a great movie. I hope we can continue someday again. And we are going to continue on June 18th. And I'm about to tell you who our lineup is for there. But first, I want to thank this fantastic panel. Obviously, thanks, Becky. A lot of fun always working together. But as Richard said, it's, you know, inclusion is a new way of thinking. And it's everything becomes so much richer when you just do the right thing. As we heard from, we heard from Kelly, you got to bring music into the branch. You could use the branch, could be whatever you wanted to metaphorically, but bring music in, and that's fun, is help that happen. And, and then, Steve, you know, you heard the ultimate um, practical wisdom of don't run out of cash here. You got to always plan ahead. Zeta, I will say your concept, I think, was one of the ones that I'm going to use. As you know, I'm going to be writing a Forbes article on this. For, um, for February, uh, for June 1st. So anyone who has great quotes, just email them to Edie or to whoever, great quotes you heard, and this is gonna definitely make it, which is leadership is like a tea bag. You see the true colors where the hot water comes. Zeta, I absolutely love that. One of the best I've ever heard. And I was gonna, you know, I'm gonna throw in Tony's one, but I wanna do Tony after I announce who's going to speak for June 18th. So for June 18th, and then I'm gonna end on an amazing concept by Tony. Um, and we know this is all about what we're trying to do is accelerate equity. So the speakers are going to be um, Kathy Ireland, who was, um, and it's 11 a.m., which is where we always have it. So on the West Coast or in Europe, you could join in. The, the famous designer, actress, incredibly successful entrepreneur talking about this. Joel Peterson, the chairman of JetBlue, and actually the first CEO I, I ever interviewed was David Nealman of JetBlue, the founder. Kelly Caruso, who's the CEO of SHIP, and that's the delivery service owned by Target Corporation. Um, Brian Gallagher, and he is the CEO of the United Way Worldwide. And actually, I know that Tony, I looked, you're, I interviewed him last week. You're on his board, actually, the largest non-for-profit in the world. And finally, Hayward Donegan, who's a CEO, and she became CEO of Rite Aid in August. And she has actually kept through with her strategy in what they're doing with COVID, which is fascinating. So now we're up to the final words of wisdom by Tony. And those words, I think something we all could use, do something different every day. If you do something different, the routine has value. That's what's gonna help you be more successful. So thank you so much. See you next month. And by the way, I think we already have over 50 people signed up for next month. So sign up early. Here's where you go. www.wbcollaborative.org. That's a forward slash, I think. ERS forward slash. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks.